The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. Introducing Macquarie ETFs. Macquarie's Active ETFs now give you easier access to the global active investment expertise and strategies that were previously only available as traditional unlisted managed funds. Benefit from the transparency and convenience of an ETF structure underpinned by the global investment expertise of Macquarie's fund managers, which offer you additional options for portfolio diversification and the potential for index outperformance. Discover everyday access to active investments with Macquarie. Visit etf.macquarie.com to find out more. Hello, welcome back to the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking uh, with Tim Lane from FinConnect. Tim, thank you for joining me today. We had a chat a little while ago personally, but uh, good to have you on the podcast. Thanks for joining. Great Great to be here, James. Looking forward to it. And so, Tim, we, you know, I kind of know you and I'll get you to articulate it. I kind of know you in the space of Working in working in financial planning businesses around kind of buying and selling and valuations and, and, and that kind of stuff. But can you tell us about the FinConnect? Who like who's FinConnect? What's the brand? It's this kind of relatively recent brand and, and yep. yeah, what you're up to. So I've been working with my team, Courtney and Fiona, now in the sort of succession valuation uh sale of business with pr- predominantly financial planning practices of all shapes and sizes for a very long time. So I started doing this work in 1999 mm. uh, uh, and that involved evolved into my own accounting practice, et cetera, et cetera, which this work was previously done under my accounting practice, which is a crew over. We just decided that a, a stronger brand presence in in this industry was what we needed. So the FinConnect brand is to really say, we're going to be specialised in this area um, and be able to solve all those problems. I think the thing for me or the passionate bit of this for me, if you like, is I have a view that um, we need to be able to provide other solutions than just a sale. A sale is a legitimate succession outcome, but FinConnect is here to solve other ways of doing it, getting evaluation, bringing partners in, retiring partners, solving disputes in, internally. So it's more than just, and its position is more than just someone who's going to sell your practice. We're going to find the solution to your succession problem. Yep. And so... It was, was is that been predominantly the work that you've done since in a nineteen ninety odd that, that that you mentioned, or or did you do other normal accounting work as well? What what what's been the mix for you? Well, so I I, I landed um, in in a in a in a large dealer group in um, nineteen ninety nine as a sort of yeah. great young chartered accountant, and the CEO said to me, Tim, I want you to go and do this role. Uh, so I ran ran the financial controller piece for one. I want you to go and do this role with these practices and buying them. So we had to buy some then. We had to yep. buy them to retain our strategic position. So I learned how to buy them, how to value them, how to do succession. Uh, when I eventually left that, um, so we were invest. So I was a direct investor. So I'd been an investor in a financial planning practice responsible for that investment. Yeah, which you know had some pretty hairy moments back in nineteen ninety nine. Um, uh, had some, you know. To be brutal, James, I made my fair share of mistakes and had to fix them. Uh, then I left into my own practice in 2007. I just kept doing part of my work was valuation succession with financial planning practices, build a team. And uh, so so I, I do my focus now with FinConnect is to make this sort of 80% of my work. Yes. Um, I have, I am, a, I have a, for the record, I am a financial planner at the moment. So I've got some lived experience. What I want to do is bring a lived experience into the into. So I've run an accounting practice, I've run a financial planning practice, I've bought and sold them, but my focus now is to to mould with Fiona, who's running this part of the practice for us, into you know predominantly we're going to do more and more of this work and be more and more specialised and be able to deploy capability in um to to the market as it needs it. Yeah. And so where do people that seek you out like where do they where do they come from how do they find you how do they come across you uh, uh 
So I'm a little bit old, James, so that a lot of people know me. Um, like because I've worked <laughs> so long at it, like I've been, I was part of the Garrison Steeler Group, the Genesis Steeler Group. I'm very, very connected to the um, uh, the Slipstream Group. So there's 80 firms in here. I've spoken at their conferences. Um, I get a lot of referrals out of that network, and obviously a, a network with 80 firms in it has a lot of succession problems to solve. So we do that networking. I think my colleagues that work with me a bit surprised sometimes when referrals turn up from people that I, you know, I knew these people 20 years ago. So, you know, they, I've just managed to keep my profile up and that, that's a way to, I think what we'll do with FinConnect is now be much more deliberate about disturbing people on the issues that we see in front of them and when they should think about it. The key thing for me with particularly succession is, you know, the sooner we can get to the problem and solve it, the easier it becomes. Yeah, the later it's left, the the more problematic it is. I mean, you and I discussed how you became an equity holder in your practice, and I think, with the greatest respect to you, that's quite unusual for people to be proactive and have the things that you went through. Um, you know, eighty percent of the world doesn't have, so yep. that's our job is to educate and to to bring them on. So yeah, and just I've just been here a long time, guys. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So what other what other problems? Like you know, you said you know you'd. You, you want to try and solve for the problem as soon as you can. Um, are, are there like certain things that you're just seeing time and time and time again that, that people are people are trying to solve for? Uh, look, I think I think there's a couple of things we see a lot of. One of them is that that comment that I made that they're late in the piece and now now they want to get a succession plan moving. Um, yes. That's one problem. Um, lack of understanding of how the valuation of their practice works is a big one. There's there's two sort of um, metrics that we can see quoted in the industry, which one's a profitability or an EBIT-based valuation, and one's a, a recurring revenue valuation. And, and understanding when to use those and where they fit in is, is believe it or not, that well understood. Um, yeah. And so we do a lot of work around linking those two things up and getting people to understand them. Uh, and then the other, there's, there's a few myths out there. Um, you know, one of the ones you... People sort of say, oh, well, I can't do a succession plan. I have to sell because they can't afford to buy in. Yeah. I mean, you know, the mathematical reality of succession is that a financial planning firm is sort of fundamentally based on a six times its earnings, and that's a 16.66% return. Well, that'll finance a lot of things. People forget that. So there's that that piece of problem. But uh, And then, you know, the classic one we see is, I had a guy in my practice, he left because I, and then you asked him, why did he leave? Uh, he was your succession and why did he leave? Well, did you tell him he was your succession? <laughs> and I reckon 90% of the comments kept, oh, not really. Yeah. Like, you know, well, there's your problem, mate. You know, you've you, you got to communicate through a succession. And, most, and a good thing about someone like us helping you is it creates a communication piece as well as part of it. So, which is it, doesn't it? Yeah, so it's yeah. yeah, that's they're the problems we see. I mean, from a an overarching perspective, I mean, we're trying to bring the financial planning into a profession, make it a profession. And so, one of the, the, the characteristics of a profession that I really believe is important is the ability to bring the next generation through in and out of a practice to build the generational learning that happens. Like accounting firms have been doing this for a hundred years, not necessarily well. And one of the challenges I see in our current marketplace, if every transaction is a large equity provider from overseas buying the practice, you know, the profession itself is doomed. We won't bring the people through. Yep. You, you touched on before the, the kind of the EBIT versus multiple of recurring revenue piece. Can, mm-hmm. can you explain where the two different methods of valuing a business might fit? Like, yes, there's sort of a, yeah, there's a historic piece of this and then, then, then I'll, I'll go. So, you know, and... A brave young chartered account in 1999, someone said, and this is how long I've been in, they used to be valued at two times recurring revenue. Yeah. That was the flat number. And I sort of struggled with that as a young accountant. So, well, hang on, surely the profitability's got something to do with it. Like, you know, but, uh, and, and what it is, is, and you've got to remember 20 years ago, they were small client bases and essentially it was two times the profit because that was what you were going to get. Yeah. The revenue was the profit. So, um, but, but predominantly the way to explain it is a recurring revenue valuation is predominantly used when you're buying a client base and adding it to a business. So, you know, it's going to 
And what we actually find is when you do that, the actual profit metric round often is round about six. It's about the same number, but it's just quoted a different way. An EBIT valuation is for a large practice or the transaction resulting from you know, pieces of equity. So it's, I'm going to buy 20% of that practice. So the EBIT valuation is the most appropriate one there. What, what, what people sort of need to be wary of is when when's to use those, when's the best time. But there is a point where they invert. And so you can end up, you know, a recurring revenue valuation won't give you as high a valuation as an EBIT based. So it's when to use them. So one is the sale of a client base, one predominantly used for a transaction on a large practice or a piece of equity. But there are, from time to time, um, uh, you know, things that are um, that that go up fall outside that. Yeah, and and if we chat a bit about the whole succession piece, you know, you mentioned this. People say, oh, some someone left, and they were my succession plan, but but I never, I never really told them that and didn't bring them in on the journey. Like, are you talking to people? Or, and I'm sure you're involved with people that are doing it well because they're getting your help. But how are how are people managing that well? Like, there's retire all the retirees oh, moving on. It's to have a plan and to have it well articulated um, early. And because what you've got to remember is that there's like if you you know you suddenly come along and say, look, James, I want you to buy 100 percent of my practice. And by the way. The capital price for that's three million dollars. You know, the young bloke's just going to go. Oh, well, you know, <laughs> how does that work? You know, whereas you know, so bringing them along the journey, smaller bits earlier. And the second thing about that is it's a balance of risk. So if I, if I'm if we're both still in the practice while we're doing it, for example, well, the risk is balanced. So one's not going to you know get a an adverse adverse um, consequence out of that. And so and then. Once you've owned a little bit of a practice, it's easy to buy the next bit because I understand how it works, I understand where I'm going to get the dividend from, I understand the profitability metric. And what the thing that people really fail to appreciate is the, you know, the lowest risk buyer is the one who can pay the highest price because they've got the lowest risk. And the lowest risk buyer is someone who already exists in the practice every time, 100% of the time. I mean, it's a really difficult, um, I've had this done succession with doctors. I don't suggest that's a good idea because that's a very difficult thing to do. But but you know, they don't understand that they're the low risk buyer of their practice. But yeah. but but their financial planner in a practice is the low risk buyer of the practice. And yeah. you've got to remember too, because in a sale you've got to do deal with clawbacks, loss of clients, all that sort of stuff. If you're doing an internal succession, there's no clawback needed. There's, you know, the clients already know, you know, the risks that that exist in a sale just don't exist in an internal succession plan. Yeah, yeah, and and how how do you finance it? So you, you you know you come to me and say, hey James, I need, you know I'm gonna I'm out of here. I want you to buy the business. I need I need three million dollars. How are people financing these these um these succession plans? Well, they, they, look, there's finance. There's sources of finance. Um, you know, uh, you know, three principal ones are Macquarie, um, Macquarie, Westpac, and NAB, but. You know, um, there are other structures you can use, though. Like, um, for example, in our practice, I've got my succession, because I'm a succession expert, I had to get it right, so I got it right. I've done most of mine, um, but one of the things in our practice, we've used a gearing strategy inside the entity to pull the debt in there for some reasons. So there's that strategy. There's also, um, but the point is, you know, the metrics will go to about uh, three and a half times but basically is for all the lenders where it sort of lands. But obviously, if you do it all in one hit, you can only get to three and a half. So you need some other capital provider at that point in time to bridge the gap. But if if you're growing it over, a, say, a five to seven year succession plan, you'll find that the equity in the practice is sufficient to keep financing, um, you know, the in and the out. So the answer is, you know, your best friend is debt. Um, mm-hmm. And then people forget the debt's, People, I think people overly worry about debt in in uh, financial planning practice. These are fantastic businesses with great cash flow, and if there was ever an asset you were going to gear, it would be this one within reason, like you know, without being silly. So, um, and then I mean, I've been working in this area for since nineteen ninety nine, obviously, and I've never seen one, uh, you know, blow up for want of a better word. They've, they've always been able to be refinanced or restructured or because the, the revenue streams are so 
so solid. You, you just you just don't really need to worry as much. You kind of hear. I don't know, not, not that I have any direct personal experience with it, but you kind of hear some horror stories from from the A and P type days. You know, I had all this money, I borrowed all this money, and I bought this client base, and then you hear stories of people they didn't pay back the client base, and maybe that didn't pay back the loan over time, and now the business isn't worth what it was once worth, what I paid for it, and you, know, you kind of get a few horror stories from from that. Well, I think then, like, and I've got some clients who are direct directly affected by this. So the A and P one is the you, you got to. With the gross respect AMP, what happened in succession inside AMP is, is a separate issue because it was based around a bowler, a buyer of last resort, and none of those bowlers were um, two things, but they weren't economic, so that the value you paid didn't represent the true value, had nothing to do with the profit route. And then secondly, you know, the risk with a bowler was it could be unilaterally reduced, and it did, it was. And so what happened there is people got, um, you know, they just ended up overly geared. Like the value they had versus the debt they had were were underwater. And but but I think that world is now sort of gone in my view. You don't see many of those um transactions happening. That most of the dealer groups, most of the um owned practices, if you like, understand now that these are done under economic models and not those um Distorted ones, for example, like the bowler. Yeah. So what? what so what's the market like out there? Like, you know, there's been you know, increased education standards and all the rest of it. You know, we see report after report after report of of you know, thousands of advisors leaving the industry and so forth. Are you seeing that play out to people exiting their businesses and trying to sell them sooner than they would have? Like, are you, is that trends you know, coming through to your side of what? what you um, I think. Um, yeah, so so the Royal Commission really killed the market for a period of time. Like, just stopped the transaction level stopped. But what what we've seen, and we get a we get a multiple view of it. So we get the view of the sale part of it, but we also get we do a lot of va- obviously valuation work. And what what I would observe out of that is that um, uh, you know when we first started doing valuations of financial planning practice, there was a lot of adjustments we did to get to what we call the future maintain learning. We had, you know, rebates and grandfather commission, all of this sort of stuff. We had to adjust to work out what the true earnings were. That's all gone now. We we, we do very little um, major adjustments to, to P&Ls to get future maintain, which tells you that what we've created post-Royal Commission is it is that the, the the earnings streams of these financial plans are very pure and very solid, yep. and so so you know I know the Royal Commission hurt, but in an inadvertent way, it's actually significantly improved the 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 robustness to the valuation of these practices because there's no noise in them, and so that that's one observation. But growth by acquisition is um uh is a major issue out there, and is you know there's Demand clearly exceeds supply. So, you know, if you wanted to sell something tomorrow, there'd be a market for it, no worries, uh, you know, unless there was some other reason. And particularly that sort of, if you said, I've got five or, you know, somewhere between five and a million dollars worth of recurring revenue for like, you know, that's a, everyone wants it. Everyone wants it. We, and, and so that's a very active part of the market. And the other one is, you know, there's a lot of external capital, predominantly from the States. Very interested in in Australia, which yeah, makes sense. Do you, do, you, yeah, do you get a sense of why that is? Like, what, why is that? Why are there so many people in the US interested in well, buying up all or part of financial planning businesses in Australia? What's what's that all about? There's a couple of things going on there. I mean, our SGL super system is the envy of the world, and so if you buy a financial planning practice which clips it, you know, in a nice way, clips the ticket of a large growing super base, that's a great. Long-term investment. The other, th- and then you've got the aging demographic, so you know the future route. So they're saying this is a great market to do this in. There's a bit of an arbitrage thing going on as well. The average American practice probably trades at about eight times the TBIT, and this and Australia is six. So I think they say, well, if I can buy the thing I've got in America for you know twenty percent less with a higher return, I'm pretty happy to do that. So, Good. so that they're the two. Factors that I see, and it's the other thing is, um, yeah, it's just there's capital looking for money, places to put it, and that sort of drives. It's a bit driven by the lack of supply, if you like. Yeah, it's interesting you commented on the 
you know, if you've got between 500 and a million dollars worth of revenue, that that, that that kind of segment of the market's pretty hot and you can sell, sell them reasonably easily. I've, I've had, over the last year or so, I've spoken to a few different people, kind of solo business owners that, I don't know their numbers, but I imagine they're kind of in that in that type of range. And the comment that they've all made in one way, shape, or form is, oh, I was surprised at actually how quickly this thing happened. It's like, I had this idea of, I think I've had enough of doing it on my own. I think I'll sell it and join something else. And then seemingly within a matter of months, it's all just done and dusted and they've got the cash in the bank and and they're now an employee of this other business that's done the acquisition. Yeah. Well, with the other thing, there is this thing that um, – it sort of emerges to this what we call a super firm, and there's a couple of them out there, you know, and and they're completely geared up to knock that transaction off without, you know, they'll just knock it off in you know three months because they they know exactly what they want to pay, they they know how to integrate it, they uh, you know they know how to do that transaction in their sleep, so the sophistication of those firms in terms of what they're doing is uh, is is has improved dramatically. And sorry, the other thing I think too, people are coming to the realization that it's a hard work, hard job being a sole practitioner in the current environment. So that probably has triggered someone to say, "Well, it's probably about time." And then the aging demographics, the other thing that you see. Do you have any ideas of what's driving this idea behind the kind of super firm that you're referring to? Like, you know, oh, I know of a few that there's there's a lot of guys in themselves. So, yeah, I mean, it's just a mathematical equation. If I can push more revenue through a fixed cost base, I'm going to get a higher profit and a higher valuation. Don't, don't worry about what they tell you. There's no rocket science. It's pure mathematics. Like it's, <laughs> it's you know, I'm going to get a bigger profit, and it's true. I mean, um, you can see it in the numbers of the bigger firms. You, you know, what people probably don't realise, which is worth, you can actually because of the size of some of those firms, they have to lodge returns with us. You can actually look at them and oh, go, yeah, right. Yeah, well, you can download from ASIC. So, for example, Invest Blue. I've got Invest Blue's um, accounts. They're behind for the record, but anyway, that's another story. But you can look at them. Um, you can look at AZNGAs if you want to. I'm pretty sure you'd be able to look at Ironbarks if you really wanted to. So there is this availability on purely because they're a, what's called a large proprietary company. So they have to be ordered and they have to be lodged. Um, so uh, the question was, yeah, and so they've sort of worked out mathematically, you know, if I get bigger, I spread this cost base. And the other thing you've got to remember, if I borrow at um, 7% say, I mean, take three years ago, it was even better. Like I borrow at 2 percent to get a 16% return. Sooner or later, that money, that's got to end up somewhere with a big, big positive number. Yeah, yeah. So, it's, yeah, it's the, so, that, so the more you could borrow, the more you could buy, and it, and it, and it makes sense on your spreadsheet, doesn't it? Yeah, well, it, yeah. I mean, the, the spreadsheet always works. Like people say to me, you know, I so said, I can make the numbers work in any transaction, in any succession. Those numbers will work. Yeah. We might need some external finance. We might need to do this. We might to hang some over a period. The numbers will work. The real issue is, in my mind, is really cultural fit. You've got to get the two working together and happy together because um, the rest will take care of itself. Yeah. Do you do much work in that? On that front, the cultural piece when you're I, helping businesses through this, yeah, it, it might. It's, so it's really part of the process. So, for example, if we're selling a business, which I do with with Bob Neal, when we do that, um, we will push the parties at a point in time to really spend some time on cultural fit because, uh, you know, in, if there's good matching and that people get on, they can see a common advice approach and all that sort of stuff. Again, most of the other issues will be able to solve because there'll be give and take. Um, and then, you know, no one ever sells their business to someone they don't know, like, or trust. So, so we, we and I so you sort of get a bit of an antenna for it over the journey and say, you can tell when it's not really there. And I would actively counsel people and say, look, you know, is this really um, where you want to end up? And it's, it's not a reflection on either party, they're just mismatched. Yeah. And you, you mentioned a bit through there about valuation work that you're doing. So is that is that valuation work that's independent of someone either buying or selling their business? Like, be, why, yeah. why is someone having their – why are they having valuation stuff? Well, it's just sort of a number of reasons, um, uh, you know, from the bad ones like I'm getting a divorce all the way up to um, I just don't understand what it's worth to him. You know, I want to make, I want to make sure I'm making money. So, so we've – Cut the valuation work into a number of products, products or different ways to do it. 
where we sort of we've got this thing called an indicative valuation, which basically will go with the client. So look, here's your FME valuation. We'll then back test that to the RR valuation. We'll say, look, these are the things driving the differences. These are the things you need to talk about. Um, and that's just an education one, really, so people want to know exactly where they're at because they don't always know, which is interesting. And then we can rev that all the way up to what we call an, like a, what's called an APS 225 valuation. And they're ones we'd lose in, use in a courtroom for, I don't really like these much, for a matrimonial case and or a, a partnership dispute. So we do get called in from time to time. They, they've, they've fallen out and they want to know what their valuation is. Um, and so they're sort of up and down that line. And then, you know, so that's when they would get a valuation. So, for example, people get, they get valuations in those circumstances. Um, my view, and I would always say this because I'm flogging my wares, I get that, but but any people involved in a multi-partner practice yes. should, should be getting a valuation on a regular cycle. Ideally, you know, maybe with someone independent like us every two to three years with an update in between because one of the problems we see so often is if people get into dispute or someone dies or something happens and there's no uh, live valuation on the table, um, the issues become so much harder to fix yeah. because it, because in it, what happens is people don't aren't rational in an emotional aren't, if they get in an emotional state, you know, it's an irrational decision process. Whereas if it's just every year, I know I understand what that is. So when someone comes along, they understand what their valuation. And it, like the other thing I always say is like this is your life asset. Wouldn't it be pretty important to actually understand what it's worth? Like, sure. call me picky, but you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, let's suggest your to your point before about. Now you've got people that are, you know you're you're working in this business and you're doing all this stuff and you're getting all these clients and there's all this money coming through the door and you've got expenses going out the other side but are you actually what are you actually achieving for all of your efforts is it is it working for are you building up something be worthwhile right. knowing, knowing I would think yeah and, and I suppose it's partly it's you know to be deliberate too because and you know I think one of the interesting things that does has a feature that we've seen come out of perhaps the post-rule commission world, is this focus on average client value and how detrimental, so detrimental or poor average um, client value is to evaluation in the end now because the market just starts swiping away at that bottom end to the point where we'll, we'll sit with someone and say, see this bottom third that's all, say, averaging 1200 bucks, you're better off it's gone before you go to the market or before you do anything. Because it actually detracts. Because what it says is, this isn't a great practice. That's what it's actually telling the market. The market says, oh, this isn't a great practice. Whereas if everything's you know, up and above in the average band that we want it to be in, that implies that we're one practice. And so it, it's partly financial mechanics, but it's also perception. Like, you know, these guys know what they're doing. What about, so we spent a bit of time talking about on the kind of the sell side, like you're just talking about some, some things to look out for there. What about on the buy side? So if I'm a business that's, that's looking to acquire. What what should I be doing or thinking to to ready myself for for an acquisition? Yes. Yeah, so so again, I flog my wares. We we run a we run a buy side sort of approach, which Fiona does. But but basically, there's a process you go to. Where am I now? What do I look like? You know what what do I need to get that to a materially better position? So I need an acquisition that looks like X, Y, and Z. And then you know if so, if I was I've looked at that, you know, how do I structure an offer around that with the components it needs to be, 80, 20, clawbacks, you know, risk management, all that sort of stuff. And then, um, you know, what does the post, um, you know, post-transaction post business look like? So that's, we, we sort of map that process and um, to make sure, because really what you, what we, and then the thing is, unless you know where your sort of valuations are running through that by process, you don't really know where your negotiating space is. So we would say, you know, here's pre-post, like you can afford to play up and down the line with your pricing around here because, you know, your, your end thing's going to come out still with the right number. Um, I have done some work with some, you know, I had a, some practices who, who got the acquisitions wrong and it was a pretty brutal conversation we had with the directors about, you know, actually taking it backwards here. Um and since they overpaid for things. Yeah. Well, 
Yeah, yeah. So, so then this is the trap. This is the trap with recurring revenue valuations and and profitability valuations. If you buy on a, if you buy something on an RR valuation, you have to make sure that the incremental profit is 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 at least so it's you know it, it's going to improve. Yeah. After debt, so you got to remember there's debt there. So you know if that and that it can actually take you backwards. Now it will resolve over a period of time. Which is fine, but if you've got to do a transaction with a shareholder in that period, you're stuffed. Yeah. So you've got to, you've got to really work through that. The thing that confuses people, and I think this is a relevant point to make, is is the market quotes recurring revenue valuations all the time. Okay. You know, and but the the actual day to day reality of what actually happened in the transaction is often priced on its profitability metric. But you can't put a profitability metric in a contract with a clawback. It doesn't work because the 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 outgo no one controls the cost base so what happens is you get the, you price it up based on the profit bit and then you go well this equates to two and a half times say recur revenue oh, that's do right. right. that's what ends up in the contract but it actually it wasn't the, the the deal wasn't negotiated on the RR it was negotiated on profitability so doc you've got to be separate documentation from you know valuation for one better word and so people say oh everyone does that well they they put everyone puts it in the contract, but not everyone negotiates it that way. And so that's how you then structure your eighty percent upfront, twenty percent later, yeah. or and after a couple of years or whatever, based on whatever revenue is retained. Because you can't say, "Oh, I'm going to do a claw back if the profit's less than a hundred because you can't control that number. The, the seller yeah. can't control that number because the cost base is with the buyer, but he can control what clients he gets across, what revenue he gets across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Years ago, I attended some conferences and there were some people up on stage talking about how they were dealing with succession and I'm interested to see if you think if this is people still doing it this way that they that they they bought in at a value to say oh you're, you know you your your dividends that you would otherwise have earned for the next four years that's your buy-in to the you know your your share of the ownership of the business or whatever it is and then then almost the same on the way out that when when you leave it's Four, four times the the dividend that you would have received on the way out. Do you see anyone wearing well, that kind of thing anymore? Well, that's just a quasi being the loan, James. So yeah. what that is is saying, you know, you get to pay four times the dividend. You're going to pay that back to the um to the outgoing to the outgoing party. It's yeah. just essentially a bit. So what they say, if you buy it now, you forgo your dividends for four years and then you own it. Yes. And, yeah. yeah. Well, it's just a quasi being the loan. It's not. It's neither right nor wrong. It, it, what it is is it just. Um, it's a way of doing it, and you know, understanding what the um, you know the financial metrics look like really tells you whether it's a good deal or not. But you know, four times a dividend, you know, you know, I, I haven't really done the maths on that, but it sounds like well, I can't even remember if it was four, but I just, I just remember it being some you know, some years worth of you know, you're, we'll hold on to your dividend for a certain number of years. Uh, and uh, and then the, almost kind of the reverse on the other side. If what you, we tend to do, going to leave. We tend to construct it if we can, and it works for the page. Doesn't always work. And some people are very anti vendor loans. I'm I'm anti vendor loans if the parties aren't remaining in the business for a period of time. There's yeah. hanging it over with no control. But if if you know particularly, and this is particularly for the first bit because you'll build equity, but. We tend to say with a, a, a vendor loan, we get a eighty percent of the dividend goes to the vendor loan, and twenty percent goes because you don't want a one for four years with no extra income. What's the point? Yeah, like yeah. You haven't got it. So that's the way we do it. Twenty to the is cash flow, and eighty is vendor, and then after you've built some equity, then you can either refinance that loan or you'll have enough equity to go and do the next part of the transaction. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah. All right, Tim. Thanks for spending some time chatting with me this afternoon for anyone that wants to kind of reach out to you and use your services find some more like kind of give yourself a plug where can people find you uh well you'll find us on on the FinConnect website which is w8 just google FinConnect. yep hopefully that goes right to the top of the google bar now we'll, uh, we'll put the link to the website in there the yeah that'll be great so um that'll be good or you know they can uh linkedin i'm on linkedin you can come and contact with i think that's where we connected up james yeah. um and uh, yeah, you'll find me relatively easy if you Google Tim Lane on LinkedIn, financial planning practice, and but we'll we'll shoot you through the FinConnect stuff. The, 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 I mean, it's a bit of a flog, but what we do say to people is because we've got a, an education focus, people can actually ring and just 
book what we call a triage call, which is a 15-minute call. We'll just go, tell us what the problem is, and we'll just go through that with them. And it may or may not need help from us. We'll say, oh, no, go and see him, or look, we can do this. Or, look, I just don't think you've got a problem. I mean, I had a, had a financial planning team recently. I said, look, all of those numbers tell me it's going all right. What, what's your problem? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good phone call to be on the other end of. Yes, that's right. Good. Thanks, Tim. Good to be on Thanks, sir. Good to chat with you. Appreciate it. Bye.